So super, super lekker to be with you guys tonight. And for those that are watching online or going to watch us afterwards, um, just welcome. Um, the guys just felt as we process what it seems that God is doing that we needed to lay a foundation of just the Word of God, the theology of how God might move into us as a church in the hope that we could prepare the ground because when God does move, uh, it very often is a little bit out of the box, different to how we would maybe even be comfortable with. And so the point of tonight is to try and in some ways prepare you theologically for what we feel God's going to do. And maybe just to back up a little bit, uh, every year I start the year with God, what do you, what do you want to do? What's, what's in your heart for us this year? And this year the Lord spoke to me, one of the areas he spoke to me was um, Andrew Josh Jen's become too tame. And I was like, okay, so what does that mean? And I felt the Lord speak to us that he was going to bring an increase in a sense of his presence and his power among us, and that we needed to, in some ways, be open and ready for what he was going to do. And our eldest camp started with incredible times in the presence of God. I, I remember in some of the sessions feeling like, oh my goodness, uh, you know, we, it, we're more there than here. It felt like that many of, uh, in some of the sessions. Um, and then the year all over the world, I began to hear across our churches that God was saying the same thing. And now we're starting to see, we've already seen pockets of his power and his presence breaking out across Josh Jen, now across 412, and also now we're starting to see overseas in places like Asbury and other areas that God is doing something fresh. Um, and um, this is not to harp us, this is not to, uh, if God, I don't, I'm kind of hoping that God does something tonight, but it's not about that. It's just giving us an understanding so that when God moves, we don't in our hearts fight him. And resist him and uh, and so the title of this is this is that and it comes out of Acts 2 16 uh, we can put it up on the board for me quickly uh, on the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit was poured out in a powerful way and um, people were very confused and we'll look at that in a bit of detail just now and Simon Peter got up and what he did was to try and explain what was happening he said but this thing that you're seeing, this outpouring, this move of God, this is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. What he does is he earths what God is doing then in a prophecy that's a few hundred years old and tells Israel, really, that this is something that God said that he was going to do. The point of this meeting is this is that, so that when this comes, you have a that to draw on and go, okay, we get it, we understand what the Bible says, and Lord, we're not freaked out or scared or confused. We are actually embracing what you want to do. And um, I, I, I do believe in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, the Bible says quite clearly that in the end times, you'll see a church with a form without power. And when a church gets stuck in formalism and tradition, without the power of the presence of God, it's a, a, it's a highway to death. It's a highway to compromise. It's a highway to lukewarmness. But where the Lord is, there is freedom, there is life, there is joy. There is always something out of the box because He is God. And when we let Him be God, when we open the door, when He knocks, anything can happen. And so let's dive into just a little bit of when God moves. And I'm going to start in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 50, 40, oh, my writing is small, 49, verse 8 to 12. And Isaiah, to give you the background, was a prophet in Israel in around the year 700 BC, so you're talking a long time ago. Israel at the time is actually in quite bad rebellion. Uh, he writes as a prophet, uh, he's my favorite prophet of all the Old Testament prophets, and he, he, a lot of his prophecy is about actually because Israel hasn't listened, God is going to raise up Babylon, this foreign nation is going to come and override Israel. But then God lets Isaiah also see beyond that. And Isaiah sees that God is a God who wants to save and redeem and restore. He actually sees Jesus powerfully. A lot of Isaiah is full of Jesus. And he sees how the Lord himself will come and deliver his people. And then he gives this prophecy about the time of the favor of the Lord. And, uh, and we're going to look at that in a, bit of, a little bit of detail now. But whenever the, the Lord has times of favor... 
There are times when he holds himself back, and there are times when he moves. In Isaiah's time, he was, the Lord is going to come initially moving against Israel, but then the Lord is going to move later to restore Israel. And this, he's prophesying, is a restoration move. And he says, this is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. Now, you must realize he's looking through Israel getting taken into captivity to a day that God's going to come and set them free. And I will keep you and I'll make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. That's a teaching I'd love to do tonight, but I don't have time. What is reassigning desolate inheritances? And then he says, to say to the captives, come out, and to those in darkness, be free. So you've got this picture, as we will carry on now, but you've got this picture of Israel kind of in this suddenly being rescued, suddenly the time of God moving, suddenly God breaking in and, you know, be free, come out of bondage, come out of brokenness. I'm going to restore the land and reassign inheritances that were lost because Israel lost inheritances when she went into captivity. But now God is going to restore and give inheritances back. Come out of darkness, be free, and they will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. So the hills are barren, it's like life is dry, there's a drought, there's no water, there's no, nothing to eat. But now when God moves, suddenly the barren hills are going to feed us. Suddenly there's going to be this you know, more than we need. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the desert heat or the sun beat upon them. For he who has compassion on them will guard them. And lead them beside springs of water. God will have compassion. And he will lead his people beside springs of water. And I want you to remember that springs of water. It's normally one of the first signs of the Lord doing something. Is springs of water bursting forth. And again, this is a picture of uh, obviously nourishment of life pouring out. Jesus actually did say that streams of living water would bubble up inside of us. And pour out. And so you've got God saying, when I move, you're going to see an increase in the welling up of the springs of life. They're going to suddenly just be bubbling over um, and pouring out. See, they will come from afar, from the north, the west, from the region of Adjuan. So what he says is then there's going to be a people are going to come into the kingdom. People are going to come out of captivity into the kingdom. Salvation in this place will begin to happen. And actually, we are part of that prophecy. We came from far. Our ancestors came from far, and Gentiles began to be saved as people came from all over the world as the Lord's favor broke out on the earth. Now, again, we, we've looked at when the Lord says, in the time of my favor, it feels as though the church is entering into a season of the Lord's favor, a season where God is doing something. And, um, and so when God moves, we lose the ordinary we lose the normal. The way things are going seem to change, and suddenly everything is different. And uh, this concept of springs welling up, and I love that. In Ezekiel 47, Ezekiel was actually a prophet that would also speak about springs. But Ezekiel was a prophet that came about a hundred and something years after Isaiah. Ezekiel was actually in captivity. So the first part of the prophecy had happened. And Ezekiel, writing as a prophet now from captivity, Right, and he says this. He says, I see the temple and I see a fountain of water bubbling up out from under the throne and running down. And it starts and it says, run down the east steps of the temple. I would argue that that's actually what happened on the day of Pentecost, and we'll look at that just now. But he says, this water will begin to come and it'll start off you know, ankle deep. And then it'll go knee deep. And then it'll go waist deep. And eventually, he says, the river will be so wide that no one could pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be passed through. And so you've got this picture of this river that gets deeper and deeper and deeper. You can start off in the river when God moves, it's ankle deep, and it's kind of like ankle deep water, you can stand, it's okay. Knee deep water, it starts to get a little bit more difficult to be normal and move around normally. Waist deep, if that water's moving quickly, you're battling. But when you can no longer stand, it's like the sweeping happens and everyone gets swept up into what God is doing. And this is what God says is going to happen when he moves. This water will be poured out. 
a river that no one could cross. And so there's new depths. There's, and how many of you have felt like depths of the presence of God? Sometimes you can come in a meeting and there's a sense of the Lord is here in a measure and then suddenly that measure might increase and that measure might increase. And Ezekiel's here talking about a measure that's so deep that, sh- that no one's standing. This is a powerful move of God. And actually, amazing, he sees this river running down to the Dead Sea, the most dead part of Israel. The water's so salty, I mean, it is dead. You, you can't, if you get that in your eye, I think you might lose your eye. It's that salty. It is, it is seriously, I've been in the Dead Sea. And he says, even the Dead Sea will suddenly have fish and life pouring out because of this river. The most dead part on the planet will find the life of God. And when the life of God hits it, suddenly life will begin to spring forth. And what many of you don't know is Josh Jen was planted and in some ways birthed out of a move of God. Um, when I was first saved, in fact, Joey and I, I don't think Nicky had even got given his life to the Lord yet. Um, Joey and I were fresh, brand new converts, and uh, we'd been saved literally about two weeks. And we heard that there was this revival meeting in Port Elizabeth. And uh, we went, Nicky was still in his, well, he wasn't even back still, he, he, he didn't know the Lord yet. And um, we were friends that did drugs together, and the two of us had got saved, and he took a bit longer. And, um, and um, we went to this meeting, and the Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in that meeting. And I remember um, being overwhelmed at the bigness of God to the point that, I, we, in fact, the whole church it was like a spirit of laughter that came over the church, and the whole church laughed and laughed and then cried and then laughed and then cried. I remember there were children crying and laughing. There were old people like crying. It was just, the meeting went on for hours. I was, I was a brand new Christian, and I was born again into this powerful God that was so big and doing something so beyond us. It was beyond anything I'd experienced in drugs, in, in, in the nightclubs I'd been in. It was like, this was God moving and blowing across his people, and it totally impacted us. And I remember becoming so hungry to encounter God in power because it was like everything changed when we were in his presence. Josh Jen was birthed out of a move of God. I remember, um, I could tell you so many stories, but I remember at one night in the church that eventually sent us out, uh, we had a real move of God in the meeting. And if I say a move of God, it literally was like if people were standing, it, it was like suddenly it looked like a wind would blow over like this part of, part of the church. And when I say the wind would blow, there would not be one single person standing. It was like, it looked like a machine gun had opened up on one side, and then they would all fall down, and then suddenly there you would see, boof, and you would just see, it was like the wind, it looked like wind moving over water, and as the wind moved over us as a congregation, people began to fall, cry, laugh. It was, it was absolute chaos. It was so, so powerful sense of the presence of God, um, and I remember um, MC in the front in worship and at one point, being overwhelmed at the presence of God, I remember it because she had these, I'd bought her these, she's cut short, and so she always wanted to be a bit taller, so I'd got her these high-heeled shoes, they were like wooden, almost clogs underneath, these like solid, like you could kill someone with them kind of shoes. And at one point, the presence of God came upon her, and she went from this to, ah, screaming and shouting, and I remember she kicked and I, I, in slow motion, I watched that clog fly off her foot. And our worship leader was standing in the front with his eyes closed, very much only aware of God's presence. And I watched this clog fly <laughs> towards his head. You know, it's like slow-mo. You think, no. And this clog li- just missed him and, and like smashed into the wall behind him. And I was like, and then she did it again and kicked the other one. And it also just, just missed him on the other side. And at one point, she was, just went down under the power of God. Um, we were all crying, laughing. Uh, I remember a friend of ours, Calvin, uh, was, he was my favorite, one of my favorite lead guitarists. He could bring the presence of God on his guitar. And he, had, he, he, he wasn't that wealthy, but he had bought his dream guitar. And at one point in worship, he was playing his guitar, and then at one point he couldn't anymore. And I remember he'd slipped, it had slipped around, and he was standing in the front, like he's supposed to be helping us lead worship, but he was just gone. Standing in the front with this guitar on his back, just gone. And then I watched him start to wave, and I thought, Calvin, do not fall on your guitar. And when he fell on it, I knew this was a move of God, because that man would... 
<laughs> I knew there's no way that he was going to fall on his guitar. And he was unawares. He literally didn't, he didn't try and break his fall. He just crashed into it. Power of God was so strong. Eventually, I think we closed church at about 11.30 at night. It was a work day the next day. People had to go to work. People were like, hey, we've got to go, we've got to go. We tried to get MC out. Nikki at this point had got saved, and so he had actually just got saved, and he was kind of like, or recommitted his life, and was kind of like staying with us, and, uh, and so we had to get to her home, but she couldn't speak English, so every time she spoke, she would, she would speak in some weird language, and, and laugh hysterically, do you remember this? We, we, we had to carry her to the car, and uh, drove home with her in the background laughing hysterically. When we got home, it was winter in Port Elizabeth. It was actually quite cold. There was a bit of rain. It was a freezing cold winter night. 11.30 at night now, and uh, we had locked ourselves out of the house. And I was like, oh, no. And the only way in, because it was burglar bars and everything, the only way in was there was a little cat door. You know those little doors that a cat can get through? And I remember I tried, and there's no way I could. One shoulder and then I hit, and I couldn't. Nikki tried, he couldn't either. We were thinner in those days, and they were still not going to happen. And then um, we realized MC is our only hope of getting inside. The problem is she is paralytic. So we carried her out of the car, and she was so, so floppy. We had, we had to try and hold her straight and then try to push her. So we carried her to the hole, and she was lying there laughing, and then we tried to hold her straight and push her through the hole until eventually we got her through, and her feet were on one side, and she was lying in the house. All she had to do was lean up and unlock the, the, the lock, but she was so gone, she couldn't, and she lay there. We were like, open the door, and she was just, <laughs> uh, Calvin, Calvin, that worship, that guy with his guitar, he was the guy that locked up the church. His family went home, and his kids went home with his wife. And so at around, I don't know what time, probably quarter, half past 11 or so, he locked the church and walked out to his motorbike to drive home, sat on his motorbike, and the power of God hit him again. And he fell off of his bike with his one foot on it, like this. And at 2.30 in the morning, the alarm went off in church, and one of the elders had to go and find out what was going on. And there lay Calvin in the rain, in the cold, at 2.30 in the morning, overcome with the presence of the Lord. <laughs> Martin Lloyd-Jones is one of the great, uh, would be regarded by many as one of the great scholars and Bible teachers that comes out of the UK. And he says this, and I love it. He says, always in revival, there is what some call divine disorder. Some are groaning and agonizing under conviction. Others praising God for their great salvation. And all this leads to crowded and prolonged meetings. Time seems to be forgotten. A meeting may not end until daybreak the next morning with nobody aware of the passing of the hours. And so these moves that happen, and I've been in a number of them, are powerful. And uh, hopefully I'll even share just how, how Josh Jen in some ways, I haven't even got to how Josh Jen was birthed out of one of these moves. I'll try and get to that just now if I remember. But um, these were life-defining times for us. They showed us a God that was so big and often showed us that we were so small. It's like you see. You know, you, you live with this veil and and in those times, you see, you see it as it really is, and, and you're never the same. But uh, let's go back to our Bibles, because we, we started off with this is that. One of the first real powerful moves of God, certainly the one that birthed the church, uh, was what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I want to give you the background to that, because when we look at the response of the Jews on the day of Pentecost, we actually see the response, one of three types of responses that pretty much every one of us will have. There will, there's only three responses you're going to have. And we see it on, in, this, in the scriptures, and then we see ultimately how we should respond. And so I want us to dig into what does the Bible say when God moved on that first day? Because what happened then, and I want to say this. God doesn't move the same in the next move to what he did in the last move. Don't put him in a box. Don't put him in a box. God does what God does. In fact, I believe this next move will be a move of the Spirit. That it'll be those who are, in other words, he blows where he wills. No one knows where he's coming or going. And I believe this next move is going to be a move of the Spirit. And that means anything could happen. That means... We just don't know. It could be that we see. It could be that we cry. It could be that we, it's whatever God is doing in the moment. And I don't have time to explain why I feel that, but I have a sense that that's what God wants to do. So in the book of Acts, 
chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, we read, the Holy Spirit's poured out, and um, the disciples are flopping and falling around like drunk people. And, um, and so, in the book of Acts, we read that the Jews were amazed and perplexed. And they asked one another, what does this mean? Some of them made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Let's get to the background of the day of Pentecost. Pentecost, it wasn't Pentecost until after this happened. This was a life-defining, church-defining moment. It was when the church arguably was born. And what had happened was the Jews celebrated different feasts. And so all the Jews from across the world would come together. To, they would literally travel from wherever they were, from all over the world, and they would gather together at their capital, Jerusalem. And so at this time, Jerusalem is flooded with probably, uh, they say as many as 100,000 Jews have traveled from around the world, and that's, that's pretty much all of them, um, from around the world, from you know, Greek areas, Egypt, all over they've come. And they've come to celebrate actually a Jewish festival, which happened on the same day that Pentecost would happen. It was a feast of weeks or Shavuot. And it, it really was a feast where Israel acknowledged that God had given them this promised land and that they had planted crops, and when those crops bore their fruit, when the fruit finally came up out of the ground, they would celebrate that God had provided everything that they would need. There was a season of abundance and bounty. And so Jews would come to celebrate that, and this was the Feast of Weeks or the, the Shavuot. But at the same time, the Jews also celebrated that Moses had got the law on this day. And so this was actually a double ceremony to the Jews. This was the day that God gave us the law and defined us as a nation. And this is a day of the provision and abundance of God. And so all the Jews had gathered together in Jerusalem. And we know Pentecost happened at 9 o'clock in the morning because Peter's response is, you guys are drunk. And Peter says, we're not drunk, we're Jews, and it's 9 o'clock in the morning. So what that means to a Jew is at 9 o'clock in the morning, every Jew who is in Jerusalem went to the temple because it was a time of prayer. And so the whole of, is the whole of what is Israel at the time is actually at the Jewish temple at a place called Solomon's Colonnade. And they are praying. A lot of us have a picture of an upper room. It's not what the Bible says. It wasn't the upper room. The upper room happened at another time. This happened actually at the temple because it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and every Jew is going to be at the temple at 9 o'clock in the morning. And the Jews have packed in there, and it's a time of prayer. The Bible tells us suddenly tongues of fire appeared and came down on a group because the disciples were gathered together in the middle, and there's 120 are praying, and they followers of Jesus. No one else is. And I... The, the tongues of fire comes on these 120, and, and they start trying to speak. But when they speak, they're not speaking English. They're speaking in the languages of the people that have come from all over the world. They don't know what they're saying, but actually they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to, to different people that are hearing the gospel in their own language. And so they obviously, they, everyone thought they were drunk, which also tells you they're not standing there waxing eloquent. If you ever, if you saw someone, a group of people, and you said, oh, they're drunk, how would they be acting? There'd be certain things that they'd be doing that would be a little bit like, they would be looking very weird and out of the ordinary and probably having too much of a good time or, you know, falling around around each other. And so the fact that the Jews said they drunk means this is crazy. This is nuts. These guys have, how could they drink at this time of the morning? And, um... Interesting, Solomon's colonnade is on the east side of where the temple is. And remember we read earlier, the water will come out from the throne and run down the steps on the east side. Guess where Solomon's colonnade, as you come out of Solomon's colonnade on the east side, there are pools of baptism where they were baptized 3,000 that day. And then that water would keep running down until it would reach every nation. And so, again, I want to just remind you that in the first move of God like this, when the church was born, people thought they were drunk, which means they were not standing there you know, preaching in their right mind. There was, some, something of a, of a, there was something of a wildness and a craziness to what was going on. The Jews said, what does this mean? 
And that's normally what happens when God moves. In fact, if you go look at Facebook right now, everyone's got an opinion about what does this mean? You go look at the Asbury Revival and it is a move of God. No, it isn't a move of God. Uh, it is because they're doing this. Oh, it isn't because they're not doing that. And it's, it, people have opinions. And I want to say hold your opinion lightly when it comes to the things of God. It's very hard to put God in a box and go, well, you know, he, he didn't do it like that, so it's not a revival. What does this mean? Amazed and perplexed. Those are two responses. The first one is perplexed. Let's look at that. Perplexed. The word in the Greek is diaporon. It, uh, it literally is a negative word. You know, a, a word can have a positive or a negative kind of feeling about it. Diaporon is a negative feeling. Some people are quite negative about this. Uh, uh, they were perplexed. This, the word perplexed is it makes no sense. This is crazy. Uh, in Luke 24, verse 4, that word is used when, do you remember, and it, you start to have an idea of why it's a negative feeling. Do you remember the story when the, 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 the woman went to go and find the body of Jesus uh, on the third morning, and they went to the tomb, and his body wasn't there. And they, they saw an angel, and they were perplexed, and they asked, that's the same word, and they asked the angel, did you steal his body? Please could you give it back to us? They, they don't understand what's going on, but the feeling is negative. And so whenever there's a move of God, you'll have a group of people that'll be perplexed. The vibe is, I don't know that this is God. I'm not comfortable with this. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense to me. Make sure you're not in that group. I mean, test everything, but be careful of being in that group. Seems wrong. But then there were others that were amazed. And this is existemi in the, in the Greek, and it's positive. It, it's it's kind of like, I don't understand this, but it, I think it's God. It feels amazing. And so, again, to show you in the Bible where this word is used, the women were first perplexed. Did you steal his body? Where is his body? But then the angel says to them, no, don't you remember? He said he would be raised from the dead. This is that. And so the woman went back to the disciples, and in Luke 24, 22, they explained to the apostles and the disciples that Jesus had been raised from the dead, and they saw an angel, and now the word proistemi is used. It is amazed. The disciples don't understand fully, but they're going, oh my goodness, this is God. Don't understand it fully yet. I don't know how this works out, but I think this is God. Then you've got scoffers. Those who mock or uh, these guys are drunk. And the word is, just it's a hard Greek word to explain, uh, to try and pronounce. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but the Greek word literally means this, because I'm going to mess it up if I try and do it in English. It, it, it's to scoff. It's, it's to scoff, deride, jeer, ridicule, or rubbish. This is junk. This is a load of nonsense. Absolute rubbish. That's the, that's the word. It, it's just, if you bring it across, they mock, they jeered. This is pathetic. You guys are drunk. It's, it's not a good thing at all. This is a total writing it off. This is not God. It was God, although many Jews didn't think it was. God is birthing something new. And because of what that, that day, we here today, I hope. I hope that whatever God does in our meetings, that you'll have a framework of theology out of this that'll go, no, this is that. So that when God does things that maybe you're, you're a little bit uncomfortable with, because you will be uncomfortable at times, that you go, no, but actually this is within the realm of Scripture. This is within the realm of how God moves. And that you wouldn't quickly write it off, but that you would open your hearts to allow the Lord to do what He wants to do within you. So let's quickly look at some of the things that happen when God moves, because the Bible is full of times when God has moved, and there are interesting things that happen whenever they do. Now again, because he moved it like that then doesn't mean he'll move that like that now, because he's God. But we need to find a framework of theology of the Bible and to learn, okay, this is within the possibilities. We're not to go beyond what's written. This is possible. This could happen. And when it happens and I see it or I experience it, at least I can know, oh, this is that. This is God. And so one of the first things uh, and the most obvious is falling down. People begin to fall in the presence of God, in the power of God of the presence of God. I remember as a young man hearing a preacher once say, 
What do you expect to happen when you encounter the God who holds all things together by the power of His Word? Who, who, who literally speaks and it is. He is the all-powerful God. He says, and I remember the illustration used was, if I had to get an electric plug and take you to the plug and stick your finger into it, what would happen to you as you encountered the power of the plug? <laughs> you would get shocked. That's 220 volts. And you would get knocked onto your back, probably unconscious. And that's a 220 volt plug. What do you expect to happen when you encounter the living God in power? When God comes and when God moves. And so in Ezekiel 3, verse 23, and now we're looking at our Bibles. Ezekiel is this prophet again. We looked at him earlier. And he has these radical encounters with God. In fact, uh, it's actually interesting just looking at, if you just look at the book of Ezekiel, at the, the crazy things that happen. But in one of the things, this is right near the beginning, he goes up, God tells him to get up, and he goes out to the plain. And the glory of the Lord was standing there. So he's a man in captivity. He's actually in Babylon. He's a Jew in Babylon. And he's part of that move of God starting to restore his people. And so he, he goes out to this plain. God says, go to this plain. He goes to the plain. And when he gets to this field, the glory of the Lord is standing there. Now, you wonder, what does that mean? What does that look like? What, what did he, how did he know? How did he sense? And I can tell you this. When the glory of the Lord is standing in the field, you'll know. You'll know. And he knows. And so what, something happens to him when he sees the glory of the Lord, like the glory I'd seen by the Kabar River. That's the, that was his first encounter. This is his second. And I fell face down. Now, this is not a, this is not a kneeling. This is not this. The, the, the language is very clear. It is a falling face down. It is, and, and you'll see the same thing um, in the New Testament. You'll see it, that there's this falling down. And an example of this would be in John 18, verse 6. And we can look at this one because a lot of people say, if it's God, you'll fall forward. This is some of the weird things that the church gets into. If it's God, you'll fall forward. But if you fall backwards, then it's the flesh. And there's whole teachings that go around. And the problem with YouTube and, uh, and Google is there are a lot of people with a lot of opinions that are going to make a lot of confusing things out there. And so guys will come up with these kundalani's and I don't know what all spirits. Uh, there's a whole lot of junk out there. Just, just ignore it. Because you go down those rabbit warrens, you're going to get lost. Okay. Jesus is about to be arrested. And um, it's an interesting story because he's, a, he's actually in his weakest place. He's about to go and get crucified. But as the soldiers come to arrest him, and these are enemy soldiers, these are men, temple guards that are coming to arrest this traitor, this, this man that they know is going to get crucified. And so there is a sense that they're the strong guys, and he is in a weak place. And they come to him and they ask, are you him? And Jesus said, this says, I am he. He actually said, I am. <laughs> and I am is one of the names of God. And so when they come to arrest him, are, are you him? He says, I am. And he's not saying I am Jesus. He's saying, I am the I am. That was the name that God has revealed to. I am. And the disciples who come to arrest him suddenly get a glimpse into who he is. And the Bible tells us, when, they, when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. The men that came to arrest him were so overwhelmed in his presence in that moment. It was like a little blast of, this is who you're arresting. They, they drew back, and this is a falling backwards. The word in the Greek is pipto. It literally is the same word used for the young man that was sitting in a windowsill listening to Paul preach too long. Remember the story in the book of Acts? And at one point, he falls asleep, and he piptoes out of the window down and kills himself on the ground, and Paul has to come and raise him from the dead. He falls out, he piptoes. These men pipto. They fell backwards as they drew back in the presence of the Lord. When the Lord reveals himself in his glory, you can't stand. I mean, there's times that it's knee-deep and you can stand. But when that river goes past a certain point, you're not going to be standing there going... I love you, Lord. 
<laughs> you get pip-toed. You fall to the ground. And the Bible is full of stories of people who encountered him and fell to the ground. And again, this picture of your, your body not being able to handle the, the wonder and the glory and the splendor of God. Another one, uh, and maybe a quick look at history, because it's lovely just seeing how, in history, how these things have happened. There's a, Jonathan Edwards would be regarded, certainly by the Calvinist school of uh, thought, but even by non-Calvinists, as arguably the greatest scholar or teacher in the history of America, which is a, quite a big thing. John Piper, who knows John Piper? John Piper bases his entire theology on Jonathan Edwards. So he's like, you're hearing, John pa you're hearing a modern version of, he copies Jonathan Edwards, okay? He unashamedly says that. In his mind, Jonathan Edwards was the greatest teacher in the history of America. Jonathan Edwards was there at the Great Awakening, which happened in America in 1725 to about 1760, and a move of God hit America that literally, today Americans are still going back to what God did in the Great Awakening, because so many people got saved that America felt like it was Christian. Okay. And so he writes, and this is a Bible teacher. He's a teacher. He's not a, he's not a, he's not a charismatic. He's a Bible teacher. Listen to what he says. And he's writing about the account of the revival of religion in Northampton. I'm going to quote him. Many have had their, this is old English, so just bear with me. He wrote this in 1700 and something. Many have had their religious affections raised far beyond what they had ever been before. In other words, people are falling more in love with Jesus than they've ever been. And there were some instances of persons lying in a sort of trance, remaining perhaps for a whole 24 hours motionless, and with their senses locked up. But in the meantime, under strong imaginations, now he's using the word imaginations, they're having strong experiences as they're lying there 24 hours motionless. They're seeing crazy things. As though they went to heaven and had a vision of glorious and delightful objects, which is a very frequent thing to see outcries, people start shouting, convulsions shaking, and such like, both with distress, anguish, and with admiration and joy. You've got to imagine being in that meeting. People are 24 hours passed out, crying out, shouting, groaning. <laughs> it is not the manner here to hold meetings at night, nor was it common to continue them till very late in the night. But it was pretty often so that there were some so affected and their bodies so overcome that they could not go home, but they were obliged to stay all night where they were. In other words, the meeting finished. It was like, okay, we're going home. And there were just people left just lying there until the next morning. Another thing that you would see is shaking. People would shake under the presence of God. And again, that picture of that plug. You must have seen that little clip of two guys building, and the one guy acts like he touches a plug and goes, uh, and, and his friend is like, ah, he doesn't know what to do because his friend's getting electrocuted in front of him. Uh, and there is a sense of 220 volts versus the presence of God. And again, to look in our Bibles in Ezekiel 12, verse 17, Ezekiel comes into the presence of God in another occasion, and this, God says to him, Son of man, tremble as you eat your food. And shudder in fear as you drink your water. Now you've got to imagine this guy. When the Lord says, Ezekiel, shudder when you eat. Shake when you drink. He is so overcome with fear at what God is about to do. He sees it. That he actually can't help himself. And he starts to shake uncontrollably. And this is by God's very command. In Jeremiah 23, verse 9, Jeremiah is talking about, uh, he sees the Lord, he sees this prophecy, and he says, my heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. What does that look like? In other words, he has this encounter with God, he sees something, and it's so overwhelming to him that it feels like his bones, all of his bones, are trembling and shaking. Like a man overcome by wine because of the Lord and of his holy words. What happened on the day of Pentecost? These men are drunk. 
You see this, again, concept of this one, this overwhelming. Your body cannot just remain as it was because of the bigness and the greatness and the mightiness of God. And it might be because you see His goodness. It might be because you see His wrath. It might be because you see His mercy. It might be because you see His judgment. But as He shows Himself to you in that moment, you're not standing there. Worship goes from, you're amazing God, to you're not just singing you're amazing God because you are experiencing Him. I love this story. Um, in the Cane Ridge Revival, which happened in 1801, and this was in a Presbyterian movement. And the Presbyterians, those lovely guys, this was a Presbyterian move. This was a birth out of the Presbyterian movement. And uh, Pete, uh, Peter Cartwright was, um, sorry, James B. Findy was an atheist free thinker. He was a reporter that worked for the newspaper. And he heard about this move of God. And so as an atheist free thinking, he calls himself, I'm a free thinking atheist reporter. He goes to the Cane Ridge Revival to try and take notes because you know, what is it, what's happening? People are going from all over the country to this. And he writes, listen to this. This is in 1801 in Kentucky, funny enough. The noise, the noise, now the people shouting, was like the roar of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy in the most piteous accents while others were shouting vociferously. While witnessing these scenes, a peculiarly strange sensation, such as I had never felt before, came over me. My heart beat tumultuously. My knees trembled. My lip quivered, and I felt as though I must fall to the ground. A strange supernatural power seemed to pervade the entire mass of mind they collected. At one time, I saw at least 500 swept down in a moment as if a battery of a thousand guns had been opened upon them. And then immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. I fled for the woods and wished that I'd stayed at home. <laughs> I love that. You said, like, <laughs> I fled for the woods and wished I'd stayed at home. I don't know what this is, but I'm scared. <laughs> he was on the perplexed side of things, okay? Not the amazed. Drunkenness. We've looked at that already. Jeremiah 23, 9. I'm like a drunken man, overcome by the wine because of the Lord and his holy words. This is this John Wesley, the father of uh, the Methodist movement. Do you remember the Methodists? Most of these moves were birthed in a move of God. So you've got the Methodists now in 17, between 1703 and 1791. This is the birth of, in, this, in John Wesley's lifetime, the Methodist movement started, and by the time he died, it was the largest Protestant movement on the planet. You're talking about plant, churches planted, thousands and tens of thousands getting saved. And he said this, this is John Wesley, on, talking about one of his meetings. People dropped on every side, as thunderstruck as, as they fell to the ground. Others with convulsions exceeding all description, and many reported seeing visions. Some shook like a cloth in the wind. Others roared and screamed or fell down with involuntary laughter. This is a Methodist movement. <sighs> Powerful move of God. I remember, I'll tell you how Justin was planted quickly, birthed. My goodness. Yeah, I have a good time. We had, a, we had a move of God that actually, I went through a two-year drought. When I was born again, I had incredible encounters with the Lord. I saw Him. Uh, I had this, uh, there was a time for six months where the Lord opened my eyes. I could see in the spirit realm. I, I, I had these incredible encounters with the Lord. And then He took me into a desert for two years. And when I say a desert for two years, I did not hear His voice for two years. The Bible went Chinese on me. I didn't understand it. It was as though a veil went over and I was just dull. And I, I hadn't sinned. I was still devoted to God. I just could not find Him. I couldn't find. It was as though something had happened to me. And um, I was dying inside. I was longing. And I think God was just humbling me because I'd got a big head with all the awesome things that had happened to me. So for two years, He put me in a desert. And then we had a church camp. And uh, it was at Jeffrey's Bay. And... Uh, I went because I was still involved in church, but I was really in a dry place. Uh, and 
you know, you're hanging on by your fingertips like, God, I feel like I'm so far from you. I, where are you, God? And uh, I went to this camp, and Jeff Kidwell, who wasn't part of our movement, you know Jeff, from Ross's side of things in Musenberg? Jeff Kidwell was ministering. And Julie, you were in that meeting, eh? and, uh, and he got up, and he kind of started sharing some stuff, and then said, the Holy Spirit is here, just receive. And God broke out suddenly in that meeting. There were probably about this many people in that camp. And at one point, I looked, and everyone was on the ground, crying, rolling, laughing, and I was standing. I felt so thirsty, and I remember standing there going, God, please, I've been two years without your presence. Please, would you touch me like you're touching them? Nothing. People are flopping around, laughing. I remember people, one Chanel was going around like an airplane. Uh, it was just, it was just k- crazy all around me. But I knew God was here, but he wasn't doing anything with me. And I'd, I'd wondered, did I sin or what? Where are you, God? And I felt so thirsty. I actually, I felt like I was going to die. And at one point, Yaku was on that camp. At one point, I got angry at God. So, well, fine. Fine. And I went to Yaku, Jeffrey's Bay was cooking, and I, we both surf. And I said to Yaku, Yaku, I'm going to go surfing, do you want to come? This is in the middle of the meeting. And Yaku said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> he was a good friend. He was a good friend. He was a good friend. And so we went. Sharon was, <laughs> I hadn't met her yet. I hadn't met her yet. And so we went surfing, and I, we surfed about an hour and a half. And when I got back, Dion and Kim were sitting right there. We're waiting at the entrance to the campsite for me. And I knew I was like in the headmaster's office when I saw their faces. She knew I'd led him astray. And she, I remember Dion and Kim, what did you do? Dion said, what were you thinking? And I remember Kim's words were, grow up. So I went back to the meeting. And actually, I got nothing through that whole weekend. Everyone had a fat jaw except me. They were drunk with the Holy Spirit. I got... I mean, I didn't even smell the presence of God. And I came home, and I, you know, you feel like there's something wrong with you. Like, God, if I, if I sinned, or, you know, don't you love me? And these were some of the questions that I was really struggling with in those days. It wasn't in leadership. It's just like, God, what, why? And anyway, we, we, we went back to our house, and uh, Julie and Milani, Milani was back from, she was a missionary, she was visiting, and Julie was there, and they were going to come and have dinner at our house that night. And we had a little wooden house on this little horse farm, and there was a little hill just behind the house, and I went up to pray before they got there, and I, I went up the hill, and I was sitting up there kind of moaning at God that He hadn't touched me, and that I was in such a dry place, and where are you, God? And as I sat on the hill, my, the house was just down below us, about ugh, two k's down, but I could see it, and uh, I saw heaven open suddenly, and I saw it looked like a whirlwind of light open and come down onto the house. I didn't know what that meant, but I knew that was God, and I was quite excited. So I ran down the hill, and when I got there, they were there. Julie and Milani were in the kitchen, and MC was, they were cooking something up. And I ran into the house, and I called them out of the kitchen into the living room, and I said, guys, guys, you're not going to believe what I've just seen. And God hit me like a bus. It felt like, it felt like, it felt like a Mack truck broke through the wall, but I, it, just, I, it just, the presence of God hit me, bah, and it threw me backwards onto my back on the ground. And as I was hit, they all just collapsed. Bah! This is my first encounter with two years. I lay on the ground on my back, and I started giving birth. Julie, remember this. I started going, ah, ah, and I knew something was happening. I didn't know what it was, but I felt like a woman giving birth. This was weird, but I was overwhelmed at the presence of God. And uh, I mean, it was wild. And that, that, that started a move that happened in my house. So people would just start to come then to our house because every time we'd say grace or something would happen, the presence of God would fall. And I remember meetings where the food would be on the table and we would just be, you know, the one time I think it was you and Milani, your, your face was in the food, I think. I remember pasta, just say grace and look up and Julie's flat out in the pasta, like lying in the... I remember got Neil Lloyd... I actually thought about him earlier, just Neil Lloyd, a, young, a guy that was a Rastafarian living in, on Table Mountain. Uh, he was running from the police. He had a suspended suspe- sentence for doing drugs and got caught again, so he was going to jail for five years. So he's running to, to the trans car to hide, and on the way up, he visited his aunt, 
visited church before he'd carry his journey, and I invited him to our home. And he visited because there was free food. And everything was normal. We looked pretty normal until we said grace. <laughs> and somewhere in grace, the presence of God fell. And, and, and I mean, everyone, it was just, it was crazy. Everyone was just crying, laughing, just overwhelmed with the presence of God. And I, at that time, was so conscious of him, I was trying to hold myself together. And I said, and Neil was just staring at us like this. And I said, Neil, are you all right? And he was white as a sheet. And, and he said, he pointed, and he had a, a necklace around his neck with, um, he was a Rastafarian. Rastafarians believe that Haile Selassie is the Messiah. He was the emperor of Ethiopia. And uh, he had a, 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 this emblem of Haile Selassie with a chain around his neck and a closed clasp. And Haile Selassie had fallen off his neck as the power of God had hit. The clasp was still together. The necklace was still in his neck. But somehow Haile Selassie had fallen from his neck in the presence of God. And I remember his words were, I said, are you all right? He looked down and he pointed and he said, Haile Selassie fell. <laughs> <laughs> And gave his life to the Lord. Eventually, Dion and Kim were elders in that church. I wasn't even leading a home group. And the elders heard there was this thing happening at Sally's house. So they came to check it out. And I'll never forget them arriving, and they were kind of, you know, like good shepherds. What is going on here? And somewhere in that night, the power of God hit them, and they were just also just absolutely bonkers in the presence of God as God came. And God, I would say Josh Jen was birthed out of that move of God because I gave birth for about six months. Every time the presence of God came on me, I'd be groaning on the ground. Something was getting birthed in my heart. Something was getting birthed by the Holy Spirit. And if you look at how Josh Jen has grown to what it is today, and you look at us, we often said it has to be God. It has to be God. And now movement with hundreds of churches all over the world birthed in a powerful encounter with the living God. And so you get powerful emotions when you see God. And I've got a few more minutes. In Psalm 126 verse 1, the psalmist writes about when God restored them. And he said, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter. Our tongues were songs of joy. When God moves to deliver, your mouth being filled with laughter. And uh, in John 17, 13, John, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and he says this, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that you may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've thought, that's an interesting statement, the full measure. In other words, you could have a half measure of my joy. You could have a quarter measure of my joy. Who's felt joy before? I wonder what measure you felt. But Jesus speaks about a full measure. And when you experience a full measure of joy, do you understand we're not talking now, gee, I'm feeling really happy. That's not the full measure of joy. Our mouths filled with laughter. Why? Because you see the deliverance of God. You see how he saved you from sin. You see how he found you wherever you were. You see your sin, actually. It's weird. You, before you're in the presence of God, you never know that sin's so bad. And it's in his presence. You see your sin. And you see the cross. You see how he died. You see his love, his mercy, his compassion. And you're not just singing, God, you're so kind. You are gone, lost, crying, laughing, Winning the lotto is nothing. It's nothing compared to what our God has done for each one of us. And when you see what He's given you, when He opens your eyes, you will not be standing there just going, you'll be still and know that I'm God. You're not going to be doing that. In Revelation 5 verse 4, John the Apostle, he goes into heaven, he sees heaven in this vision, this encounter with God. And he sees the whole earth, and, and I want you to imagine this, because this is a vision that he had, and remember, he's the same God. He sees a vision of the whole earth, and the angel comes, and he says, he, there's a scroll in the front, and this angel looks out over the whole earth and says, is there anyone worthy 
to open the scroll. And John looks at the whole earth, every human being that's ever been born, and he says, there is no one worthy. In other words, he saw humanity in that moment. He saw our sinfulness. He saw that we're not, nothing like God in who we are. He saw how all fall short of the glory of God, how all together have become worthless. He saw it. It wasn't a theological concept. He saw it. And when he saw it, I wept. And I wept because no one was found who was worthy. This is an overwhelming angst in your soul as he sees the depravity of man. And then in that vision, and I want you to imagine John in a meeting with you, and he suddenly sees something you didn't see. And he starts weeping and groaning and crying out because no one's worthy. And then the next vision, the angel says, wait, there is one. There is one. And he sees the Lord Jesus, the lamb that was slain come to the front, the one in all creation that was worthy. He sees the goodness and the mercy and the kindness and the righteousness of God. And Jesus is worthy to open the scroll. This is not church as normal. This is, this is overwhelming emotion, overwhelming encounter. <laughs> I love, again, Jonathan Edwards Ah, it was very wonderful to see how a person's affections were sometimes moved when God did, as it were, suddenly open their eyes and let into their minds a sense of the greatness of His grace, the fullness of Christ and His readiness to save. Their joyful surprise has caused their hearts, as it were, to leap so that had they been ready to break forth into laughter, Tears often at the same time, issuing like a flood and intermingling a loud weeping. Sometimes they have not been able to forbear crying out with a loud voice, expressing the great admiration, the manner of God's work on the soul, sometimes especially, is very mysterious. When you see Him, when it goes from a theological construct to seeing the mercy of God for you, the love of God for you, when you see how small and frail you are, that you dust, and yet he looked at you and he loved you. That before he made the world, when you see it, when you see it, and when he opens your eyes to see it, it's no longer a theological concept. You see yourself. You see your sin. You see the mercy and the kindness of God. And that's not just a word on a board with theological thought. You see it. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, 4 about visions and revelations and seeing inexpressible things. And listen to this. John writes in Revelation 1 that he was in the spirit. He's actually on, in a jail on the island of Patmos, and he gets a book of Revelation and a vision. And he says, on the Lord's Day, it's a, it's a Sunday, he's in the spirit. And he hears a voice. He hears a voice. He hears a voice, guys. Have you ever heard the voice of God? When God, you know, he speaks to your heart. And you sometimes have a sense of what he's saying, and then you hear a voice. This is not, I think, the Lord's saying. This is like, pay attention, I'm speaking now. And he sees the Lord, and he falls down as one dead, and he's terrified, overwhelmed with fear. And the Lord says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You see, when the Lord moves... Church is not everyone sitting in their chairs. and This is when, when God breaks in, when the river gets deep, you're not standing in the knee-deep stuff anymore, the ankle deep. You are in the presence of God. And, I, and I, again, sometimes strange things happen. Listen to this, Ezekiel 3.9. And I want you to imagine this. Ezekiel is told, look, what do you see? And Ezekiel sees a hand appear in front of him with a scroll. Now, this is in the spirit. It's not a literal scroll there, but he's in a meeting, and I want you to imagine, Ezekiel's next to you in worship at the end of this or whenever it is, and he's worshiping the Lord, and the next thing, he, the Lord says, look, and he looks, and in the spirit, he sees a scroll coming to him. And then the Lord says, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat the scroll, then go speak to the house of Israel. Has anyone ever eaten a book before? 
what does that look like? And then, this is what he says. This is Ezekiel next to you, and he hears, you don't know what's going on. You're just noticing Ezekiel, something's happening with Ezekiel on this Sunday. God's doing something with Ezekiel. The next thing, he opens his mouth. And the Lord gave me the scroll to eat. So, he says, son of man, eat the scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. He opens his mouth. And then, the Bible tells us, so I ate. And it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. Mm. Mm. But when it gets to his stomach, it goes bitter. Starts off, mm, mm, ends off, uh, uh, as he begins to encounter what the Lord is actually feeling about his people. See, it, it, it's not normal. It's, it's not in the natural mind, you look at this and you go, this is just weird. These people are drunk. They've lost the plot. But for Ezekiel, he's seen the Lord. Listen to this. In Ezekiel 3, verse 14 to 15. And I'm not going to do much of Ezekiel. I'm finishing in literally the next two, three minutes. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness and in the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me. So he, he gets sent away and he's got the presence of God upon him as he's moving, but he's, he's, he's actually got a bitterness and an anger in his spirit because he sees what's going to happen. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kabbal River, and there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days overwhelmed. So he, he walks into a meeting and sits down, and he's overwhelmed for seven days. Just gone. Yeah, you know, there was a lady, what was her name? It's, Maria Woodworth Etta, she was preaching somewhere in America, I think it was, it might have been the UK, I forget where it was now, America, sharing in a meeting, and the next minute the, the presence of God came. She said she saw a vision, she was taken into heaven. What she didn't realize is, for her, the vision was a quick little vision. But actually the vision, in, in what happened to her body is it froze, they call her the frozen lady. In the middle of sharing something, she stuck. She was overwhelmed, body just froze. She's in the presence of the Lord hearing him say things, but her body's stuck here. I think it was three days. She's gone. She's overwhelmed. The meeting's watching. She's just stopped mid-sentence. Everyone's watching her. What happened to Maria? Does she have a fit? What's going on? She's just stuck in the presence of God. Eventually, people start realizing God's doing something. Apparently, the power of God hit so strongly that even people who are in their kitchens within a few kilometers would suddenly become aware of the presence of God. They would fall down in their kitchens, crying out in repentance. People began to come to see the frozen lady. And for three days, she stood frozen. And then after three days, she carried on speaking mid-sentence. <laughs> and they went, you were gone for three days. And she was like, I was gone for a moment. Overwhelmed. He does it for seven days. <laughs> Ezekiel 3 verse 26 and this is a wild one I'll finish with this and then one more quote I will make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth <laughs> so that you'll be silenced and unable to rebuke my people for their rebellious house guys what does that look like Ezekiel's in the presence of God he comes out the presence of God he's a prophet what's God saying <laughs> Ezekiel I don't know what you are saying. His tongue is stuck to the roof of his mouth. And actually God is using him actually as a physical object lesson. He can't speak. When the Lord moves in power, when the river rises, life is not going to carry on as normal. And again, we don't live for the moment. We don't live for the... But when the river rises, let God do what God wants to do. And I'll finish with Jonathan Edwards again, a quote. And why I want to use him is because he's regarded as one of the great Bible teachers, the greatest in the history of America. And uh, he comes from a school of thinking that is very theological and very much the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. Many churches today, which we, we joke about in some parts of, even in our country, it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Scripture. There's nothing of the Holy Spirit anymore. He's the Father of, he's one of the great fathers of Calvinism in America. And he said this, and I want you to hear this from a Bible teacher. Preaching 
has no effect because it causes no effect. I'm bold to assert that there was never any considerable change wrought in the mind or conversion of any person by anything of a religious nature that he ever read, heard, or saw who had not had his affections moved. When the spirit of power stirs our spiritual affections, such unutterable and glorious joys may be too great and mighty for the weak dust and ashes of our bodies. The discoveries of God's glory, when given in a great degree, have a tendency by affecting the mind to overbear the body. Think about that. Preaching has no effect unless it moves something in you, unless it moves you to encounter, experience, until the Spirit takes words and makes them alive to you, and you're convicted you're aware of something. You're aware of God's bigness. You're aware of your smallness. God moves in different ways. And I'll finish. I am finished. I remember hearing a man preach once. I was in the front row of a huge auditorium. And uh, as he was, he was speaking very monotone, sitting at a chair, he was an elderly gentleman speaking, David Pawson. And he was talking about hell. He was just going on, like reading scriptures, and he wasn't shouting or screaming. Or He was just, you know, the Bible says this, and he's just soft-spoken. At one point, as he's speaking, I become aware of hell. I mean, not like a theological concept, like I am aware of hell. I am aware of what it is. I'm seeing it. And then I'm aware of the justice and the holiness of God. And I'm sitting listening to this man, and I'm starting to get overwhelmed at God, but it's going to be really weird for me if I get down on my knees and do something, because he's just talking. But I am becoming more conscious of God and less conscious of the people. Until eventually, I felt like I was going to fall out of my chair because I was becoming so fearful at the bigness of God. And at the same time, so wondrous that He would love me and forgive me. And as I decided I can't do this anymore, I was going to get out of my chair. I remember Big Mornay, I worship lead in those days fell out of his chair and fell on the ground and started sobbing next to me and I fell down next to him and then a whole lot of people just fell out of their chairs and we began to just overwhelmed at the bigness of God. I love those times with the Lord. I love when I see him as he is. They define me, they shape me, they mold me in ways that a thousand preachers can't do. And I feel like the Lord is, is there is a season where the Lord is Wanting to move in power. And I'm not suggesting, I'm not going to try and set you up for tonight. I almost feel like just closing the meeting. And because we can't make God move. We can try and manufacture, but it's not the real thing. Ultimately, He moves or He doesn't. But I do believe this, that He has said that we're entering into a season of the Lord's favor. According to the weather charts at Three o'clock this morning at Malpo Strand, we're going to get the first rain we've had in a while. I can't wait. I'm so over this February heat. It's been very hot for those that are watching from overseas. And then at five o'clock, they're saying, is it going to be heavier pouring out? And then at about 10 o'clock, they say the rain's going to properly fall in 11. That's what the weather chart predicts, rain. Sometimes you get a little sprinkle. Sometimes the floodgates open. But listen to me. We're entering into a season of the favor of the Lord. And I believe that God's going to move in different ways. As we worship, we might see Him. We might sense Him. We might, we might experience Him in different ways. But I feel like open your heart to what God wants to do, whatever that is. Whatever that is. So why don't we stand together? How great is our God? I want you to know that He is the God who longs to move amongst us. He's not a God that wants us to know about Him theoretically. The words used in the Bible for knowing God are all experiential words. That you would know Him. That you would hear His voice. That He would say to you, this is the way. Walk in it. That He would convict you of even things that you might do that you're not aware of that are offensive to Him, that He would wash you and cleanse you and renew your heart. 
And so, Father, in this moment, you are our God. And, Father, it feels as though we're already in your presence. So, Lord, would you do in us what you want to do in us? Would you remove the old and bring about that new man and woman we created to be in Christ Jesus? Father, would you, would you move upon us in power and raise us up out of these earthly bodies, these tents? I love what the scripture says, that we carry in these earthen vessels this glorious, glorious, beautiful thing, the very presence of God. Worship you, God. Be glorified, God. Be glorified and glorify your name, God. Be glorified. Worship you. I do have a sense of his presence, and I don't want to run away from his presence. I'm so scared of trying to... I don't want to manufacture anything, but his presence is here. And so I want us to just remain in his presence a bit longer. You know, we started off, and the Lord's just reminding me of... In the time of my favor, I'll reassign desolate inheritances. And those are inheritances that were given to somebody that were lost. You, you think of a King Saul who was told that he would defeat the Philistines, and yet he lost that, and he died at the hand of the Philistines. Or Esau, who was the firstborn, and he lost it because he didn't treasure it, and the Lord reassigned it to Jacob. I feel like this is a time of the Lord wanting to reassign desolate inheritances. To breathe and put things upon us as his sons and daughters. Because he's a good father. And he wants to give good gifts to his children. So just allow our heavenly father to minister and to give and to pour himself out. He's actually a God that deserves so much more worship than we bring and give. But actually he's a God who prefers to give than to get. He taught us that. Better to give than to get. And I just feel like in this moment, let him just give himself to you. He is the treasure. He is the pearl of great price. He's the one who wants to take you and me by the hand and walk with us every single day shaping us and molding us into his image and into his likeness speaking to us by the spirit empowering and enabling us to do what we cannot do in ourselves for his name's sake and for his glory and so Lord would you even move here would you reassign those desolate inheritances Father I even I'm so convinced that even what I'm walking in was not firstly given to me, it was given to somebody else and they lost it. Father, would you reassign? Would you reassign? Worship you. Worship you. I feel like the Lord wants to say this to you and me. That this is a time of His favor. That no matter what you've done, no matter how you might feel disqualified, because of what he's done, because of his blood, if you believe, he promises and says that he will wash you whiter than snow. He says you can come in to my presence freely and find grace in your time of need. And I feel like the Lord wants you to draw near. The scripture comes to mind. If you seek with all of your heart, I'll let you find me. If you seek, if you spend a little bit less time on Facebook and a little bit more time in prayer, in the Bible, not, not out of some sense of duty, but out of a sense of hunger. Out of hunger. God, I want to know you. Show me your face. Show me what you like. As you seek, as you seek, He's waiting to be found. He's waiting to be found. And I feel like this is a season where the Lord wants to draw people that have even feel like they're on the outskirts in. He said, come in, man. You're my son. You're my daughter. Come into what I have for you. Stop believing the lie of the enemy and enter into, enter into 
that my spirit will be poured out on all flesh. Poured out on you. Poured out on you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Streams are refreshing. Streams in the wasteland. Just right where you are. Just, just, I feel like I just receive what your heavenly Father wants to give you. Put your gaze on Him. Put your gaze on Him. He's made a way. Father, and just, I pray for a spirit of intimacy, a spirit of wisdom, and a spirit of revelation that you would anoint them even now that they would know you and the hope to which you've called them. Their glorious inheritance that's theirs, kept for them and the saints. Do it, God. Do it, Father. Do it, Father. Do it, Father. Worship you. Worship you. Worship you. Worship you, God. Thank you, Lord. I feel like I want to speak to your soul and say this. You are loved by the Father. You are loved by your God. You are loved with a love greater than understanding. With a kindness and a mercy beyond your comprehension. You are loved. You are loved. Worship you, God. So I feel like the Lord wants to walk so much closer, so much more intimately, so much more tangibly. I actually feel like part of this move is not just going to be about meetings, but about us just carrying and walking in His presence. Like an open heaven, a sense of Him, a sense of Him speaking to us, unveiling our own hearts, before him showing us himself showing us his face showing us his attributes who he is and what he loves do it God this is your good pleasure God you give good gifts you give good gifts and the greatest of all is you. you. Gave yourself to us, God. Gave yourself for us and to us. We worship you, God. Who is like you? Who is like you? Who is like you? Thank you, Lord. So we're going to officially close the meeting. The guys will carry on up front as long as they want to or able to. And you're welcome to remain in the presence of the Lord, or you're welcome to go home. But I want to say this. If you go home, know this, that this is the time of the favor of the Lord. This is the time of the favor of the Lord. Seek Him. Seek Him. And He says, if you seek with all your heart, I'll let you find me. I'll let you find me. And I feel like the Lord's going to come and peel away scales of some of our hearts in this next season where our hearts have just grown calloused and the busyness of life or sometimes the love of sin or the world he's just going to peel away calluses and give us the soft heart to see him to know him and to love him to love him so father i pray just even as we do go home for the presence of the holy spirit who you said would never leave us be with us to the very end of the age father i pray that we would walk in the holy spirit with the holy spirit that you would shape and form by your spirit your life and your presence in us in jesus name Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.